that's really not the attitude to have. So normally what I do is uh, I'll sing some of him, but since I'm here and I was told by a beautiful young man, we're observing, so. <laughs> so I'll be I'll be singing. It's gonna can you see on the screen up there Psalm 19 and 7? Okay, on the left panel. Right there, when my air is moving. Okay, that's what my wife does. But anyway, that's where I'm coming from. Psalms 19 and 7. I'm gonna I'm gonna sing this song. I hadn't sung it in years. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of Yahweh are true and righteous all together. More to be desired are they than gold, yea, than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them is thy servant warned and in keeping of them there is great reward father i thank you for your everlasting word i thank you for your power i thank you for your might i thank you for all of the things that you have done for us how you have brought us from darkness to this marvelous light. I thank you for loving us and giving us the knowledge of your will. Help us to realize what it means to walk with you, to talk with you, and to be your people. Strengthen us with might within the inner man, fill us with your spirit and that the words of our mouth and the meditation of our heart will be acceptable to you always. Amen, amen, and even so, amen. God most High has been most gracious to us and has allowed us to continually go into this book of Nehemiah and to be able to extract the juice that's in this book. And one of the things that I've determined that I've learned over the years is this. Many can go to church. Many can go and worship. And church worshiping would just be a thing where individual, all that the individual does is have a religious service. But when we're talking about walking in the kingdom of God, the Most High God told Abraham that your seed, your descendants will possess the gates of his enemies. Now, either we're going to do what he says or we'll be possessed by our enemies. We will always, there will always be someone that wants to be in charge. And so since we've gone through Ezra, 
Now we're in Nehemiah. And before we did Ezra, we went into Haggai. We showed that in these passages, our people were coming back from captivity because they had gone against what God said. Most high God had told them, do not go over there and learn the ways of the heathen. I didn't save you. I didn't set you apart because you were greater in number. You weren't the greatest. You weren't the wisest. You were the fewest of all people, but I cared for the fathers. And they went and they learned the ways of the heathen. In Leviticus chapter 26, he had promised that if they would do what he said, you wouldn't have to worry about warfare. You wouldn't have to worry about numbers. I would give you my battle. And Deuteronomy he said, I'd send the hornet to fight for you. But if you turn against me, I'll plague you. I'll make you suffer. I'll give you seven times judgment for this. And if you're not turned from that, I'll do it again. Leviticus 20, Leviticus 26 give you the, the template for the curses. Leviticus 26 will give you the curses that he said that would come on his people, including the captivity. And Leviticus 26 was written when the elderly people were still alive. The curses that most people know about in Deuteronomy 32 comes after the fathers have died, after they are dead. And now you got Moses before he dies, giving it to the children of those people. And now you've got the, the curse is given and it's expanded so that you can see it, you can feel it, you can taste it, you can touch it, you can smell it. Moses told him in Deuteronomy chapter 32 verse 8, Moses said, look, when the, when the Most High separated the nations, he did it according to the sons of God. Your King James will say, according to the sons of Israel, the children of Israel. Israel wasn't a nation at that time. But your Septuagint version will tell you according to the angels of God, but your Dead Sea Scroll will say, Beneha Elohim, sons of God. And the rest of the nations were given to what we call other celestial or what we call disembodied beings. The Deuteronomy 37, 32 and 17 said they didn't worship God, they worshiped demons, the word that Shadim. And we learned how to turn away from the Most High and follow that that wasn't supposed to be. When they got to Babylon, as I've said many times before, they were stripped in as much as Nebuchadnezzar could of their culture. He took the greatest of the people, the smartest of the people, I'm gonna teach you my language, I'm gonna teach you our way to live, I'm gonna let you eat our dainties. And Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, they purposed, and Azariah, they purposed in their heart not to defile themselves with the king's portion. We know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and Belteshazzar, which is bad, that we know our people by the name of somebody that named them like a dog. Like, well, you know, you get a dog and you name it Rex, which means king or something like that. They stayed there for a while, but back in Jerusalem, Ezekiel was trying to get the people to turn, to turn, to turn. They wouldn't. So when Nebuchadnezzar came on down, like God told Jeremiah, three deportations, which mirrored what had happened in 722 BC when Assyria took and scattered our people throughout all the world. God is now keeping his word and allowing them to come back. And we saw in Ezra, they were coming back and God Most High gave Ezra a authority to rule from the west, I mean, from the, from the east of the river. Couldn't be the east, because they was at the east from the rest of the west of the river, all the way back into Africa where the Persia ruled. Gave him authority to exact and control the laws of what would be. And if he said, put him to death, put him to death, I believe it's Ezra 725, put him to death. If they, if whatever, if they had to be, have their lands or whatever confiscated, do it. But their, their job was to rebuild the temple, to rebuild the altar. Those are concrete things that were to be done. But the spiritual significance of building the temple and the altar is for you to see that there's a place where sin is to be dealt with. That there's a place where I deal, where you can see where the wages of sin would be exacted, where you could see where, where the Lord accept the sacrifice, the temple where the spirit of God was supposed to dwell, because there's going to
there's going to come a time where it's not just going to be the spirit of God dwelling like that. There's going to be a time when the spirit of God is going to be in the situation where you're going to see the spirit of God dwelling within you. In the beginning, the spirit of God was dwelling inside of that tabernacle. And I'm not talking about Abraham's time. I'm talking about when he built the first tabernacle, he had a dead animal skin, ram skin, dyed red, badger skins, all of this. And his spirit would come and sit on top of that. In the daytime, it would be a cloudy pillar. In the nighttime, it would be a fiery pillar showing that the spirit of God could be moved, could be moved around and the Kohathites would carry it on their shoulder, a type and a, a figure for the time when the son of God would come to earth and that he would dwell among us and we would behold his glory showing that the time would come after we see that this happened when he says you destroy this temple in three days out this body a temple in three days i raise it up it was talking about his body we are the temple of god we are the temple of the holy ghost and the spirit of god is supposed to dwell within our flesh he's supposed to be able to walk in us and talk in us and he be our god and we be his people this is what we're supposed to be looking for so when they built that concrete altar when they built that temple, that was a type and a spirit of you having yourself in your heart where you can have your sin dealt with, where God can dwell with inside of you. And now Nehemiah is dealing with the wall, the protection, as I've said before, the place of judgment that you can determine what goes in, you can determine what comes out. You'll be able to make sure that individuals are vetted before they get to come in and do the things that they want to do. This is the beauty of what the Most High God was doing. Well, in looking at these magnificent things, I want us to go back to our text today and just see some things. But I got a question to pose first. If you, my sister, those that's on the line with me, if the Most High God today say you are in charge of this world, Everything has to go by what you say. And I'm going to judge you by how you execute judgment. What would you do when somebody steals from someone? What would you do in the case where someone just kills somebody randomly? Would you put them in jail? Would you put them to death? What would you do for identity theft? What would you do when somebody lies and have somebody locked up, bear false witness? What would you do when somebody goes out and lays with another man's wife? Where are we gonna get our standard of judgment? You see, we can take the American standard of judgment, we can take the Chinese standard of judgment, we can take the Australian, we can take everybody else's, but if you were put in charge today and you were gonna be held accountable for making righteous judgments, what would you use to make the judgments to rule? And if you think this question is a, is a ridiculous question, somebody is already ruling. Are they ruling by the most high? In America, we got so many, I don't know how many thousands of black men locked up in jail that shouldn't be locked up in jail because somebody is ruling. Somebody is legislating and orchestrating their, their ways and their value system on the world and then renting those prisoners out through CCW, the prison industrial work camp, and then we'll have people that are conservative, Sean Hannity, but name one, Somebody say, Tim, you're jumping on Sean Hannity. Listen, I've listened to Sean Hannity about 25, 30 years. I listened to Rush Limbaugh 30 years. I know what they say. I know what they say. He says, we like the rule of law. But whose law? You see, any law that man makes that's outside the will of God is a law that's already outdated. It's a law that's already wrong to start with. Anytime you want to take the authority of what God says and make your law an unjust law, an unrighteous judge. I watch my conservative brothers, brothers, because we share humanity, not ideologies. 
whenever something happens on one side where they say they're conservative and they say, well, we get locked up, we lose our job, you do things to us. And then one on the other side that they say is the progressive or on the Democrat side, they say you do nothing about it. Well, then you say that there's a two standard of law. They say there shouldn't be two standards of law. There should be only one rule of law. But when it comes to us, when it comes to those that share my ethnicity, when it comes to those of us that have my skin color, why is there two sets of laws? Why can you go to the Congo? You can go, you, you in a little city, a little place called Belgium, you can go to the Congo and rape, rob, pillage, and take the land. Why can you go to South Africa and do that? Why can you take a man, walk in the street? and lock him up under convict leasing in America and make him a de facto slave. Why is it that you can take somebody, she can go in the house, a police woman, and just kill a black man and then get on the phone with her boyfriend while she committing adultery with this person and then the judge go and hug this person and say it's okay and then the brother being saying that he's forgiven. Why is God's laws? Why is it that when a black man can steal something or sell a little bitty rock, little bitty piece of crack, he can get years in prison and other people can sell pounds of coke, kilos? Rule of law? That's why I listen. Oh, I like listening to conservatives because they show me how to argue. The rule of law. But if the law is man's ma man-made law, You've denied the most. If you were in charge, what would you do? See, because I'm going to submit to you that if you really read the Bible, if you really read Torah, the instruction of God, then you will see that the most high God wanted everyone to know the laws. He didn't just want it to be to a special guild that the, that the people that were sophists could use to get you what you wanted as they did in the Greek days. He wanted you to know what was right so that you could judge your leaders, so that you could judge the community. And so these people back in Nehemiah's day, they're coming back and they have it to orchestrate the rule and the judgment of the kingdom of God in the land. Let me share this screen right here so that we can look at this and start squeezing the juice out of it. I'm going to go to here. As a matter of fact, there's a great right here. Nehemiah chapter seven, verse one. I want us to look at this passage and I want you all to understand that today my emphasis is on maturing. It's on maturing. We have to mature. If we don't mature, like the Most High God say, and grow up, then we're going to be doomed. We will always be children. Mature, grow up, and be faithful. Let's look at our let's look at our passage. We're going to take six verses from here. Uh, the other part where it deals with the names and things like that. If the if the Lord's will on Thursday, I will deal with that and show the, imp the importance of genealogy, the importance of being able to be militarily uh, in the position that they were at that time so that you can protect your own. But I I'll be showing it according to what the scripture says. So let's look at our passage, Nehemiah 7 and 1. Now it came to pass when the wall was built and I had set up the doors and the porters and the singers and the Levites were appointed that I gave to my brother Hanani. Let me close this. That I gave to my brother Hanani and Hanani the ruler of the palace charge over Jerusalem for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. That's where I got my title from, from here, from this, this one part right here that I gave my brother Hanani and Hanani the ruler of the palace charge over Jerusalem for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And I said unto them, let not the gates of Jerusalem be opened until the sun be hot. And while they stand by, let them shut the doors and bar them and appoint watches of the inhabitants of Jerusalem 
everyone to his watch and everyone to be over against his house. Now the city was large and great, but the people were few therein and the houses were not builded. And my God put into mine heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them which came up at first and found written therein. These are the children of the province that went up out of the captivity of those who had been carried away whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, carried away and came again to Jerusalem and to Judah, everyone to his city. In the reading of this word here, we can always look at this as just history, but, re but realize all history is theological. All history is theological. If not a bird fall down to the ground that the heavenly father know it, if the, if the most high God predestines individual before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him in love, if the most high, and I'm using if in the word sense, since the most high said for us to teach our children when they rise up, when they sit down, when they go by the way to teach the wonderful work, works of him, then what we begin to understand when you start talking about history being secular versus sacred, you're talking about a false construct because secular secularism is religion according to Humanist Manifesto 1, 2, and 3, I've read them, they're online, it says secular humanism is a religion. Therefore, when they teach history, it is also theological, it is also a belief system, and it's always about to further their agenda. When the most high, when we look at our history, what God has done through us, what he has done through our families, what he has done through our people, we're supposed to look at it and see what the most high has done, what he will accept, what he will reject, how he works, how to have patience with him. Therefore, when Paul looks at the scripture and Paul quotes Deuteronomy a lot, a lot. You can't give me Romans chapter 10, verse 9 without knowing and, and being intelligent anyway and knowing that Paul is quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 30. And when Paul says whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scripture might have hope. Looking in this passage this way, let's look at what was and let's look at what is. It came to pass when that wall was built, they had it where it wasn't mocking them anymore. One time they were mocking them, little flocks go up on the wall, they go up on the wall, that wall gonna fall down, that wall, these Jews, what these little Jews gonna do? The breaches are now closed. The wall is built. You can't just walk in and out any way you want to. Now it's built, the breaches, the breaches have been handled. And now in the last chapter, we went into six, the doors weren't up. Now he says in chapter seven, I've set up the door, the entrance and the exit, everything now, it can be controlled going in and coming out as long as you man the doors. And then it says, not only that has taken place, now we got porters, we'll talk about them, and and the Levites are appointed. So now you got somebody guarding the doors. The doors are up. You got people that will sing. There's been a sign to sing. You got the Levites. You got the individuals going to teach. And so now you got what's necessary on the outside to present or to help keep an attack from coming upon you. Because before they had the Ammonites wanting to attack them. Yeah, they did. They had Sam Ballard, the Horonite, and Tobiah was the Ammonite. And then you had the fake. The fake Jews. What 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 do you mean? Well, weren't those people in the in the first Kings chapter 17? Weren't they brought down to Kim? It may be second Kings 17 and type it in on my chat. Uh, King 17, and when they brought those different people into Samaria, and those people didn't know Yahweh. They were from other countries. So then they went and got one of the priests to teach them, but those priests have been following Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that made Israel to sin. 
that had changed God's holy and most righteous days, who had married Jezebel, the daughter of Ephbel, if people call her a whore. Why did they call her a whore? She wasn't, you find nowhere in the Bible she was giving up her stuff to nobody. You found her ruling and being in control and having people scared. Even you had prophets scared of her. Well, at least we know uh, Elijah ran from her. Jehu. <laughs> yeah. But every now and then the Lord bring a Jehu on the scene. And Jehu was not afraid of that woman. But I would submit to you that she brought in that Baal worship like it hadn't been done before. And so as we look and we see the walls are set up in a concrete fashion, what about our minds? You see, the word of God is to build up our walls, the walls of our life. The walls of our mind. What are you letting go in your mind? Porn? Oh, oh, I wouldn't look at porn. You mean to tell me some of these movies that they show on cable? This person naked, that person naked, these people doing stuff that ought not so to be done in front of our eye gates. These persons, they're lying, they're stealing, they're doing certain things, they're bringing about different kind of debauchery in front of our eyes and we, we don't we don't man the gates. We let the door stay open. We let people sit in front of a desk like this. Breaking news today. So and 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 so. And often we'll just lie. Let me give you a case in point. There's a little boy that got shot a couple of days ago, six years old. Man tried to hit him with a sledgehammer and the little boy said, I'm, I was too fast. <laughs> it was kind of cute to hear that, but it was sad that the situation. So the man went through the house and shot through the door and shot the young boy in the arm. And as that happened, we see that no big deal on regular news. No big deal on regular news. As a matter of fact, you don't hardly get to hear, hear it mentioned because the guy that did it was Asian. And so the new thing now is to stop Asian hate. Well, the thing is often that people tell me to stop Asian hate. They have a lot of hate for us. They have a lot of hate for the word of God. They have a lot of hate for God's holy and righteous word. But I'm not justifying anything, but what I'm saying is this wickedness that was done. Let me show you how they will read the news. <clears throat> Breaking news, six-year-old boy was shot. Uh, let's go back and see what he did in nursery school. Well, in nursery school, he took somebody's milk. Well, when he was a baby, he messed in his diaper. Well, let's go back before he was born. Um, and before he was born, he had already lived in another life and he had killed four or five people. I'm using this stupid illustration to show what happens when we allow our eye gate to be controlled by the news. Often the news, when a black person gets killed, that's what happens. And what they do is first, they'll show it over and over again to get black people stirred up. Then they'll, especially if it's a case where there is something that the black person did, but they don't show that at first. Get you real angry, get you upset, get things going. Then a little bit more come out. Then a little bit more come out. Oh, then we show the film. Do not do understand, do not think about the wall as just being the wall that protects your city. It's the wall of your mind. What you're hearing, diligently inquire, seek to see what's going on. Know the justice and judgment of God because of the fact that I've listened to a lot of conservative radio. I've seen that scenario come out over and over again. And I will promise you, I'm scared to promise, but I would say that odds are very high that somewhere along the line, this young boy has done something to make himself get shot. And my point is this, if you can't control what you watch when you watch TV, whether it's the news, whether it's the radio, the songs, the things that come in your mind, Jesus said, if you look at a woman to lust after her, you've done adultery in your heart. 
If we don't allow God's word to be our wall, our protector, and the thing that we use at the open and access and in and out in our life, we're going to be just like a city without walls. We won't have control of our own spirit. So it says, now when the walls were built, I had set up the doors and the porters. It's important that we understand that the porters this is a defense mechanism that the Most High has given his people. A defense mechanism to be able to take his word and to be able to use it to keep out that which we don't need in our way. And I'm going to show it to you. I'm going to pull another Bible over here on this side and make it be my, be my link. So when I do that, what will happen is you'll be able to see everything go to here when I click on a note. I wanted to do it that way. Because if I didn't do it like that, then I'd have to keep moving the same one. I didn't want to do that. So send hyperlinks here. That's what I want. Look at this in Numbers chapter 3. When the Most High God was setting up the tabernacle, they had been out of Egypt about a year. About a year and now he's starting to get ready to send them into Canaan to go and establish the kingdom. Now, it took 40 years, not because of the Most High, but because of their provocation of the Most High God. So when they were building the temple, he was showing them the importance of sanctification, the importance of not being defiled. So look at what the Bible said. We're going to talk about the sons of Mirai, and then you'll see what happens. It says that under the custody of the charge of the sons of Mirai, there's one of the sons of Aaron, shall be the boards of the tabernacle, the bars thereof, the pillars, the sockets, thereof and the vessels thereof and all that serveth thereunto. Again, the tabernacle is the equivalent of the temple where God's spirit would dwell. The tabernacle is the equivalent of who we are. Uh, we're supposed to be the temple of God and we're supposed to be the living temple built up to a holy temple unto the Lord according to Ephesians chapter two. It says the pillars of the court round about their stockings, their pins and their cords. But those that encamp before the tabernacle toward the east. The east is the entrance of the tabernacle. That's where the entrance was. Those that encamped before the tabernacle toward the east, even before the tabernacle of the congregation, east which shall be Moses and Aaron and his sons, keeping, keeping the charge of the sanctuary for the charge of the children of Israel and the stranger that cometh nigh shall be put to death. They were the police force. You don't just allow anything to come and touch the temple. You did not allow anything to just come and touch the tabernacle. You did not allow, just allow anybody or anything to come inside that tabernacle and do what they wanted to do. Our mind should have something that, and when it comes in, we should be able to put that to death. We should not be, we should reject that. We should not accept that. And this is what Nehemiah was setting up people to do when he had people that were keeping the door. We had people that were keeping the door in the time when they had the tabernacle because Moses on the east side and you if you know anything about the book of numbers they'd have the three tribes on the left the right north and south that's what they would have and so when we talk about the porters I thought I would be kind and give a uh, something read something about the porter as opposed to just hearing it this is coming from what is called the cyclopedia of biblical and theological ecclesiastical literature and I went through a lot and I like this one the best a porter this word when used in the authorized version does not bear the Martin signification of a carrier of burdens. You know, like when the people at, at the air, not airport, but in hotels used to carry people's bags, they should call them porters. It says, but denotes in every case a gatekeeper from the, lattice, from the Latin porteress. The man attended the porter. The original word is sure are, or sure are, a gate once and it goes through Chaldee because a lot of times people don't realize that Hebrew got Cal they have Chaldee in the Bible, etc. It says the meaning is implied in First Chronicles 9.21. Listen to this one. And Zechariah, the son of Meshelema, was a porter of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. I like this one because it gives the reference that it's talking about. And then it says it's generally employed in the reference to Levites who had charge of entrances to the sanctuaries, but is also used in other connections. So entrance <clears throat> inside the holy place, 
not just the holy place, but the holy area, the tabernacle, that was their job. And it says, the Hebrew word is doorkeeper. I came down and I said, I saw something I liked in the last part, because I'm not going to read all of this, because with the issue that we had starting, I truncated some of the message, but not the meat. It says, the porter of the temple were the guards, as well as porters. The porters of the temple, who were guards as well as porters, were enumerated in David's time, for in 1 Chronicles 23 and 5, no less than 4,000 are mentioned. And I'll read that passage and I'll go back. Moreover, 4,000 were porters, and 4,000 praised the Lord with instruments which I made, said David, to praise therewith. So when we sing in Nehemiah and we are talking about porters, we're not talking about something lightweight. What we are talking about are individuals that are in the position to be able to lift up and to exclude and include what was necessary for the people to see what God wanted them to see about protection. Let's go back to Nehemiah 7 and let's extract some more from that. Nehemiah 7 and it says, and he had porters and singers. Well, when they had singers, the singers had been appointed. And I would read that, but we can do that in discussion if, there, if there's going to be any. David had appointed people to sing. That was their job. Their job was to sing. They would sing psalms. They would sing different kind of things that were set up, and that was their job. But what Nehemiah, what we find Nehemiah is doing is Nehemiah is giving them an additional job to do because of the stress of the moment. Remember, they got enemies on the outside. They don't want everything coming in on the inside. And what often we don't realize is that we have enemies on the outside that want to come in on the inside. That's why Paul could tell the people be not deceived evil communication corrupt good manner it didn't say it might have said it does so it says the singers and the levites were appointed and i gave my brother hanani and hananiah the ruler of the palace charge over jerusalem you can only give that which you have legitimately you know because somebody can steal your car and get out of it but i mean we're not going that way it says he was ruler of the palace, charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. That word faithful, I, I like that word. I'm going to open up the inner linear so you can see it. It's imit, and I just want you to see. If you look down from that word faithful, there's the Hebrew word. That's the transliteration, imit. He was faithful. The word faithful can mean faithful in so far as being dedicated to the Most High God, and it also means true true to what he's supposed to be and it says it says he was faithful and feared god above many do you realize that the fear of the lord is the beginning of wisdom the fear of the most high god is the beginning of wisdom but look at who how nehemiah picked his brother and look and see how he is deeply rooted in torah in exodus chapter 18 the lord had taught moses how to put people in charge to help rule his kingdom. Look at verse 21 of Exodus 18. Moreover, I shall provide out of all of the people able men, such as fear God, such as fear Elohim, fear God, men of truth. See that word emmet? It's the same word. It's the same word as faithful. It's used interchangeably, truth, faithful. Men that fear God, men of truth, men of faithfulness, hating covetousness. How much better would our world be if men that were over communities, if men that were over cities, counties, states, if men that were supposed to be executing righteousness, if the men hated covetousness, if they hated greed, if they hated bribes. In the United States government, they don't call it bribes, they call it lobbying. It's the same thing. What it is is philosophical alchemy. You just change the word, but you don't change the essence, and then they call it spin. Like rumpled stilt skin, spin and straw in the gold. Liars! Men that hate it. Hate covetousness. And place such over to be rulers of thousands, rulers of hundreds, and fifties, and tens. And let them judge the people at all seasons. And it shall be that every great matter they shall bring unto thee, 
but every small matter they shall judge. So it'll be easy for thyself and for them that bear the burden. That was the wisdom that was given to Moses. But yet we have so many people in this world that tell us we ain't supposed to judge. Where they get that from? Jesus said, John 7, 24, judge not according to appearance, but judge righteous judgment. Jesus says, beware of false prophets that come to you in sheep clothes, but inwardly they're raving in wolves. 7, 15, Matthew, you will know them by their fruit. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 and 2, don't you know that the saints who judge the world? Dare any of you to go before the unjust and not before the saints. Matthew 18 is about us judging. Me and this brother come together. We can get it right. Can't bring two or three more. Can't get it right. Then we tell to the church. Can't get it right. Then he can go before the courts outside because then we treat him like a heathen man in a cup, uh, uh, as a publican. Always supposed to be in our purview to do God's will and execute righteous judgment in the land for our King eternal, immortal, invisible that dwells in the light that's unapproachable to man. But what we want to do is we want to fit in with this society and in fitting in with this society, often what we do, we go and we deny the very thing that God wants us to have. And by denying the thing that God wants us to have, we put ourselves in the position of judging him and judging his standard. That's wicked. That's ungodly. I want no part of it. So he was faithful. By being faithful, he was a man of truth. He was a man that hated covetousness. And it said he feared God above many, which I think stood out. But let me help you to understand. What does that mean he feared God above many? In that position of being in charge, I pause for just a moment because this is going to get grave. It's, it's the part that many of us never reach to when we come to the Most High. Many of us will go to church and sing and dance or whatever. and That's all you do. That's not it. It's not about just a place to come and do your religious practice. Your lifestyle should be one that walks so much with him that when you come, you're bringing him honor. You're bringing him homage. Tim, where you get that from? There were three times a year that the, the men of God were supposed to come and present themselves before the Most High, like in the book of Job, when the sons of God, they came before God and then Satan came and they came to present themselves on in the, what we call the heavenly realm. And then on the earthly realm, it was to replicate that. When we came, when they would come before God, they would have lived all the rest of their life pretty much wherever they were, wherever they hit scattered to. I'm not talking about on a dispersal of something that was wrong. I'm just talking about wherever they came from. Deuteronomy chapter, uh, I believe 14 and 26, let you know there were certain times they would come back and they would bring stuff. When they would come back, that wasn't the first time they were serving God. That's all of them didn't live in Jerusalem. But when they came back to serve, it should have been an outpouring of who they were, how they lived, how they walked. And now we're coming to present ourselves before the king. So when we talk about this passage, I want you to see about a faith, what it means to be faithful, have your walls built. And I want you to see the New Testament equivalent because so many people have been taught if you don't show New Testament, it's not valid today, which is a damnable lie. But because of the fact it's a lie, I, I'll just I just try to avoid it. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 8. Hebrews 5, verse 8. We're talking about this man is faithful. And I'm saying that we need to be faithful. We need to be faithful. We need to mature and be faithful. So Hebrews 5 and 8, listen to what the Bible says about the Messiah. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Though he, though the Christ, though the Messiah was a son, yet experienced he, or did, learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect. Look at that word, teleos, teleo, which means to be perfected or to be matured. He became the author of eternal salvation unto all that do what? Look at that command. It's in orange. He became the author of eternal salvation to all those that obey him. Verse 10, being called an high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing that you are dull of hearing. We'll talk about the priest of the Melchizedek on the next one because we saw that he has Levites, he has singers, he has Nethanims and all of this. So we'll show where Levi actually set the pattern for Christ to come after the order of Melchizedek, which will supersede that priesthood. It says, of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again, which be the first you understand that? The first, the whole archaic, like the like when you talk about archaeology, things that were been in the beginning, the first principles of the oracles of God, and look at this, and are become, that word there become, genomai, become, it's a condition, but I want you to see this. When you see that light up right there, all this is doing is showing me it's a verb, perfect, completed, active, indicative, second person plural. I want you to understand what's happening. This is something that you weren't. You now you can become stupid, you can become fat, you can become fit. You are become such as have need of meat. I mean milk and not strong meat. But everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the words of righteousness. You are not mature for he is a baby. What if Nehemiah had put Hananiah up and Hananiah was unskillful in the word? He was not a faithful man. He was immature. But we do this in our assemblies. Often we will have people that are immature, such as need milk, that don't even do meat. And many of us can go over and over and learn the word of God and do not get to the place where we are mature so that we can give our children meat, so that we can give those that we talk to. If we're going to be fathers of somebody else that's not our child, we should be able to give them something to eat, something to grasp onto so that they can walk with the most high God. Yeah, we, yeah, I'm telling you the truth because I know Mark chapter 10, Peter asked Jesus, we don't left father and, I mean, we don't left house and home and everything. What do we get? There ain't no man that left father, mother, sister, brother, house and home and all that he should not receive in this lifetime a hundredfold. We talk about sons and wives, not wives, but uh, 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 sons and daughters and houses and land, but he said with persecutions. It says for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness. Remember the question I asked, if you had to rule this world, if Yahweh put you in charge of ruling this world today, if you had to make all the judgments of crime, how would you go about doing it? How would you set up his kingdom? But the other thing, the other question is, if the world was dependent upon you and what you know about the Bible to know what God wants and you had no Bible left, no commentary, you had to go from what you remember. How much would we have left? If we don't think the time will come in America, they will take our Bibles like they've done in other countries. If we don't think the time will come that they make, like I got this digital thing here and you know, I, my wife told me, Do, don't you get rid of your print books. Do you know that they can go and with one update, they can take where God say not and remove the not. Or where it says shall not, just, shall, just leave shall. Any of those books, if we don't have God's word written in our heart, and in our mind, whenever the real situation in life come up, it ain't time to try to go find your Bible and look it up a lot of times. It needs to be in there so the spirit can quicken it inside of us and that we'd obey. So let's look at verse 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. See, that's the same word when it talked about Jesus being made perfect. Teleos, mature of strong age, even those who by reason of use, by reason of use have their senses exercised to be trained to discern good and evil. And that's a powerful statement, to discern good and evil. I would turn to it, but before the sake of time, I'm gonna tell you what it is. First Kings three and eight, first Kings three and eight. Solomon had been put on the throne to be king and the Lord had appeared to him and asked him what you want. And he said, I'm young. 
I don't know how to go in and out, but now I'm, I got to judge this, you're great people. And by not knowing how to go in and out, that's my concern. Give me wisdom so that I can judge, so that I can rule your kingdom. Because the job of the king is to keep the administration of the government of civil justice right before God. And God gave him the wisdom to do so. But the one thing he said he didn't know how to discern between good and evil. Until we can take God's word and know what's good and evil, we don't even have a go we don't have anything controlling our doors to our mind. If we don't discern between good and evil, they can tell us, for instance, they passed HR 2282. If they hadn't passed it, they're going to pass, they're going to pass it. It's called the Equality Act. I see preachers going for it, okay? I see people like Carlton Pearson. He's talking about the gospel of inclusion. Well, being holy does not mean inclusion. Kodesh means to be separated to the most high God. That's what, that's what it meant. That's what it still means. It ain't changed. But even in Greek, it's hagias. means the same thing. The real issue is, is that when that determining what good and evil is, that's when man tried to take control of the world. That's what Eve was presented. If you eat of this, you'll know good from evil. You'll be like one of us. You'll be like one of us Elohim, a disembodied being. See, because some people only think of Elohim as being God. That's not what the Bible teaches. No, the disembodied beings, whether they were the spirit of the dead, like when Samuel was called back from the dead, or different other beings, they were called Elohim. Sometimes they'll be called Shadim. Sometimes you might hear them called a seraphim, a cherubim. You might hear different names that are used of other being, other dimensional beings. But when we talk about Ha Elohim, we're talking about the, we're talking about God. So it says that the, the Satan said, you'll be like us. Then when Laban came to attack Jacob, he had all that mouth, and then he let it slip. Your God told me yesterday night, don't say anything to you, whether good or bad. Now I'm reading this at 17 years old. I'm saying, why are you talking? I couldn't understand. If God told you don't say anything, why are you saying he told you not to say anything good or bad? I didn't know good or bad is to make judgment, to make a judgment, to ex execute judgment on somebody. And so we see that the Bible says a man that's mature, a man that is faithful to the cause of the kingdom, he can make righteous judgment. Why? It's the reason of use of the scripture, not what he thinks, not what our society say, not what my anger says, it's God's word. So here is where we go when I say grow up. You have an exercise of discernment between good and evil. Look at six and one Hebrews. Therefore, leaving the principles, leaving the beginning of the doctrine of Christ. You have so many people, you don't preach Christ every time. You don't say Jesus every time. It, it, you, look, when I went to Bible college, they said every sermon, you bring it back around and you talk about the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus, never the ascension. The death, burial, and, the, uh, the death, burial, and resurrection. I mean, the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus would not save you. It would not control the world. you got to have the ascension. you got to have him raise up and get that kingdom and authority and dominion as in Daniel 7 and 13 from the ancient of days where he's given kingdom, dominion, and power, and authority, and he sits at the right hand of the Father. you got to have the ascension. That, that means his sacrifice was accepted. And then that's why Stephen was able to look up and see him standing on the right hand of the Father. The death, burial, and resurrection is one part. It was accepted. Yes. And what did the Bible say in Philippians chapter 2? It says he was obedient unto death, wherefore also God has highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name, that at the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, of Jesus the Christ, every knee shall bow. So we leave the principles let us go on to perfection. It doesn't mean we don't talk about the Christ dying. It doesn't mean we don't talk about the death, burial, and resurrection. But we don't leave out the ascension. But we are now moving to kingdom. This is what he's talking about. How do we deal when wives and husbands are going against each other? How do we deal when somebody's stealing from somebody? What do we do when somebody's mistreating somebody in our community? What do we do when we have a situation in our assembly? How do we deal with it? We don't know how to discern. We're going to law. 
a brother coming to church is a brother coming here still there from Pastor Grace Church, and I don't know who stole it. I'm just gonna pay him. I know what the Bible says about restitution. I'm responsible right now, okay? I just pay. It said, let us move on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. How many times we got to tell you to repent? How many times we got to get you out of doing dead works? And of the doctrines of baptism, how many times we got to teach you about so many times, go get baptized again, go get baptized again, go, go a washings over and over again, or of laying on of hands. Every time I pray, you got to lay my hands on you. Or every time somebody, God can't move unless we lay hands. Really? That was a centurion in Jesus' day. He said, all you got to do is speak the word. My servant will be healed. I'm a man under authority. And then it says of resurrection from the dead and of eternal judgment. And this is what we do if God permit. It is impossible for those that were enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and made partakers of the Holy Ghost, having tasted of the good word of God and the powers of the world to come, if they shall fall away to renew them to repentance. First of all, I want to show you something that's a damnable lie in the King James Bible. First of all, you see when I click on that word here, if, look at it. It's first of all, you see that, that little dot, that means that word is not there, okay? The word would have been, and having some version will have that in there. I, I don't want to go through and pull it up. I can do it in, in, the, um, in the note. But say, and having fallen away, that's why I won't even show up here on the translation. But if I say fall away, then you will start seeing other translations will show how it is listed, for instance. The uh, NASB says it correctly, who haven't fallen away, okay? Uh, where is ESV? LEB haven't fallen away. That's the Lexham English Bible. Uh, ESV is up here, and haven't fallen away. How do we know that they are right and the King James is wrong? First, the word is not there, but in my Bible, I have the orange part highlighted as verbs, okay? And that's important. Look at that verb. Can you see that? Let me pull over here. Verb, aorist. That means we would consider it to be in the past tense. Something that happened in the past time, okay? Then look at this. It's aorist participle. So it would be having fallen away, okay? Plural accusative. What I want you to understand, it's already done. They put that if there because, remember, if you go to Google, you could type in translators of the King James Bible and look at the images and you can, I've, I've done it before and look and see what denominations that they were of the one that we have. I still use it, I still love it, but when I see that, I deal with it. It says it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. People will tell you that once you fall away, then you fall away because you can't be renewed. I'm gonna show you that's a lie. Seeing that they crucify to themselves the son of God afresh, Notice the word crucify here and the verb. Notice the verb is very important. Verb is present. It's active. It's a participle. So that means seeing they are crucifying. Right now, they're still doing it. They're crucifying themselves, the son of God afresh, and putting him to an open shame. The point that's being made here is when we mature, we begin to understand it's a consequence of letting everything come in our mind. It's a consequence of not being protected. There's a consequence of turning away from the Most High God. And what we get in most of evangelical Christianity is if you got a house full of sin, I got a house full of grace. You can sin anything you want to, and it doesn't matter. I got books to show it. I got a lot of books to show it. That it doesn't matter how you live, that Jesus died and paid for your sins past present and future. Well, you might as well go ahead and buy the brown Roman scapula. It's called a scapula. They sell it in the Roman Catholic Church and the priest bless, bless it. You can wear it no matter what you do. When you die, you go to heaven. Because what has happened is when you divest it, when, when you divest God's word from what it is and then you make it to fit the people that's going to come over here and colonize America, Barbados, the West Indies, and you got to justify how you're able to steal men and you're going to justify how you're able to kill men and take their women and, and, and rape them. You got to justify that and you justify it with the grace that has been turned to lasciviousness and it's wicked. But I'm going to prove this and then I'm going to move on and we'll be about through. Let's go to John. 
because I noticed a, a lot of time when I pull that, people don't see it. John 3 and 18. Most people believe John 3 and 16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Well, they don't look at the verb. The verb is always active in his presence. But the, the 18th verse is what I want. He that believeth, see that? Verb, present, active. He, so that he that is believing on him is not condemned. He that believeth not, verb, present, look at it, verb, present, active, par participle. So he that is believing not is condemned already because he has not believed on the name of the only begotten son of God. Now, if when you tell me that if a person fall away can't be renewed, because he's crucifying himself, the son of God afresh. You should tell me this person can't be, um, the person that's wicked and don't believe in Christ can't be saved because this individual is not believing either. But when he stops being an unbeliever, when he repents, he's no longer the unbeliever and he can be turned around. This is what the wisdom is. Other than that, why should a person ever consider to repent or change if there's no consequence? God always showed consequence. That's why in Exodus chapter 19, he set the mountain on fire, made it quake, came with all the myriads of angels so that the people would fear him. And he said, Moses, come up here, come up here. I'm going to make them fear you forever. I want you to be afraid of me. You won't be afraid of uh, nobody like Pharaoh. You won't be afraid of the, the Moabites. You won't be afraid of the Canaanites, the Perizzites, you won't be afraid of anybody if you know who to fear. And then the Messiah say the same thing. Fear not men that can kill the body. That's all they can do. I'm going to tell you to fear. Fear the one that if he's killed the body can place body and soul in the hell. Again, when we look at the scripture, mature. Maturity is getting to the place that not only do we protect our walls, but we protect our gates we protect everything that's necessary to be protected so that we can do the will of God and build up our community, build up what God wants built up for us so that we as people would do the word of will of God. I said on the last few things right here in Matthew 7, 21, Jesus is talking about building the walls. Somebody say he said a house. Okay, so are we a tree? And the Bible said we like a tree, or are we sheep? And then the Bible says sometimes we like sheep, but didn't we say we like grapes? Oh, so the Bible uses many pictures that give you a full orbed aspect. Matthew 7 and 21, the Most High says, Not everyone that say unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. He that is faithful. He that is faithful, that's the one that's going to enter. He says, many, look at what he says. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Didn't we do church? Didn't we do some things? Didn't we? Didn't we? And he says, then we prophesy in your name, in your name, cast out devil, in your name, did many wonderful works, and I will profess unto them, I never knew you which means you did wickedly and I forgot your righteousness. This talks about in Ezekiel 18 and 33. It talks about both of those chapters. He said, depart from me, you that work iniquity. Here is the key. Therefore, whosoever heareth these saith the mind and doeth them. Whoever's going to be mature, whoever's going to be faithful, whoever's going to have the wall built up in their life so that they can help build up the life of the community of the believers, the believers build up the community that you live in, whoever is going to do the protection, because if the protection don't come from y'all, guess what you end up with? You can watch all day long and it's going, you wake up too late or you wake up in vain. If the Lord don't keep the city ain't kept, period. He says, Whosoever hear these sins of mine and do with them, I will liken them to a wise man that built his house upon rock, the rain descend. And then you all probably know the rest of it. The rain come, the flood come, the one that hear and don't do, the one that's immature, the one that think just, just being religious is enough. The rain come and the flood came back on the, on the first one. One house is destroyed, one is not. I would submit to us, look at the lives of how we live now. Look at us owning maybe one half or one percent of all the wealth in the world. Look at how we're marginalized by the people that control the media. They're the same one that put the black face on to make fun of us. They control our schools. They control our seminaries. 
when are we going to go back to the most high God? The one thing that they don't want to do is control the character of how God acts. They want to control the information that's given out about him. So in Romans chapter 11, I want to end with this. Well, Tim, you didn't finish the verse six. I don't care. I got a lot of Bible left to finish. But look at what the Bible says about being faithful. Look at what the Bible shows about being mature. Paul is saying here, he's talking to his brethren, and I, I could read in the first verse, but I want to expedite. In the 13th verse, for I speak to you Gentiles, as much as I'm an apostle to the Gentiles, I magnify my office. I, I'm going to make my office bigger, okay? If I by any means provoke to emulation them which are my flesh, so when people say it don't matter what your genealogical background is, that's a damnable lie. He says, ah, I'm provoking those that are of my flesh. And he already says in Philippians 3, I'm a Hebrew of a Hebrew, I'm an Israelite, I'm a Benjamite. That's what he says. He says, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be? What shall in the future the receiving of them or us be? But life from the dead. For if the first fruit be holy, Abraham, Yishak, Jacob, can we go back to Shem? Can we go back to Enoch? Uh, it's a, if the first fruit be holy, the lump is holy. If the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some branches be broken off, if many of the, the Hebrew people, if many of the Jews were broken off and in a state of being damned, yes, they don't believe, they're condemned already. If they don't change, they will stay damned. What did they ask Peter? Sirs, what must we do to be saved? They weren't saved yet. Yes, we know Jesus a Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Yes, because you killed an innocent man, you should be put to death. The Father didn't kill you. But he didn't give you eternal life because what Peter said, you killed the just one and you took somebody else. Sir, what would we believe on him? What if some of the branches be broken off? You being a wild olive tree were grafted in amongst them. You partaketh of the fatness and the root and the fatness of the olive tree. Gentiles, do you understand this? You're not in charge. Can, can I... Can I, I want to see if I can say that harder without raising my voice. Gentiles, people that are not descendants of Abraham, you are not the overlord of what God's people are doing and how they do it. And when you've done it, you've done it illegally and you've done it to the detriment of the world and especially those of us that share my ethnicity. You don't like me saying it? Prove me wrong. It says, boast not against the branches. Every time we start telling the truth about who we are, what we do, you start saying, well, what does it matter? It don't matter. Why has everything been shaped like it does matter? Why does everything have to get your approval? And because you're going to usurp some kind of authority, it says, boast not against the branches. I will submit to you, most Gentilian Christianity is boasting against the branches, and it is wicked because it's outside of God's will, it's disobedient. But if you boast, you bear not the root. When God allows the rebirth of a nation to take place, let the root be shown. Let the root be shown. Boast not against the branches. But you bear not the root, the root bear you. But thou wilt say the branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Paul says, well, because of unbelief, they were broken off. But you stand by faith. Be not high-minded, but fear. This is... This is what this is the word of God. We want to be mature. We think we got to fall around with everybody else saying we can't stick with God word for ourselves without their permission, without overlord permission. That's not mature. That's not being faithful. Bless God forever. And then it says, For if God spared not the natural branches, take heed, lest he spare not thee. Behold, therefore, the goodness and the severity of God on them which fail, severity but toward the goodness. If, see, 
evangelical Christianity would have stopped right there. But the God of heaven, those of us that are believers of one Messiah, like in the Boom Church, those of us that believe in one Messiah, those of us that believe in the word of God, we understand if you continue, look at it, if it's conditional. In logic, it's called modus ponens. It's an if-then situation. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise thou shalt also be cut off. And they also, if they abide not in unbelief, look at that, shall be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in again. We followed a lot of things that we ought not. We followed Christmas. We followed Easter. We followed a fat little baby doll with the arrow that we're calling the cherubim. Look, nothing like a cherub in the Bible. We followed the day of the dead called Hallow's Eve. We, we, we celebrate days like the 4th of July. We, we celebrate, celebrate, because they have decided that we can control your culture by what we give you. If we don't abide in unbelief, we can be grafted back in. Paul said he did. He says all of this to provoke them to jealousy. The same jealousy that God said would take place that Paul talked about in Romans 10 and 19. The same jealousy where God said, I'm going to provoke you. You provoke me. Deuteronomy 32 and 2. I'm going to provoke you. So in, let's go back to Nehemiah and let's end because we'll have to pick up on this at the Most High's will on Thursday. It came to pass when the wall was built. A wall being built is not enough. It has to be manned. It has to be maintained. I had set up the doors. Setting up the doors is not enough. You've got to be able to maintain the door. You see the same thing in John 10. He says, you know, the door, the door opens. And he said, now I'm the door. And then he says, the singers. You got people that were designed, that were set up to sing songs that would matter, that was designated, consecrated. They didn't have Snoop Dogg coming in singing, okay? They didn't have the has been, no good rock and roll, rhythm and blues coming in singing, taking over the surface. They didn't have Kanye coming in with his crew of people and living God knows how, whatever to take over. They had designated singers, they had porters, and they had teachers, the Levites those that would look out for people. And then with all that in place, now you're ready for someone that's mature, someone that is faithful to rule over the people. And how is he going to rule? David says, he that rule over men must be just, ruling in the fear of Yahweh. With that, I'm going to end our class with just saying, let's grow up. Let's be mature. Let's realize that the judgment of this world is based upon us knowing how to execute and to speak God's judgment in the situations so that his maturity, so that his kingdom will know no end because it's set forth in righteousness and judgment. How? Because we walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit, that the righteousness of his law, that the righteousness of his Torah will be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Father, thank you for your blessed, eternal, and holy, and righteous word. I appreciate you giving us an example of men that hazarded their lives, that had to fight to even build a wall, that had to fight to even restructure the tabernacle, and the altar, and the whole time that they were building, they were under assault. But they built that place where they could have protection because you told them to have it. And they put up doors so that they could discern who and what and when should come in. Help us to have that much wisdom in the true, the true wall that you want to build for us and how you want us to worship you. I ask these things for all of us. In the blessed name of your holy child, Jesus the Christ, Yeshua, HaMashiach, amen, amen, and amen. I now open our class for discussion. If there's any discussion or if I provoke the thought that it can be given, um, conference line is open as well. And not only is the not only is the conference line open, but it's also open on the 
Zoom. Any comments? Any disagreements? We might not have any comments today. If we don't, that's fine. But at least I gave the opportunity. I see one thing on chat, let me see. Okay, when I was talking about them bringing in the people in Samaria, that was Second Kings. I should just lock that in. It's at the end of the kingdom age that they did that. They brought those people in and they thought that they were the Jews, remember? The woman at Samaria. She's trying to tell the Messiah. We know what we worship. Are you can't hear you, Tim. Say what? Can't hear you too well. How long have you not been able to hear me? I had a speaker on my, uh, projecting your voice, but I took it off. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Okay. You could have just said, open your mouth. But, uh, <laughs> but the, the thing is, is that they brought those people in, and she's talking about, are you greater than... I, the animals, this this whale is here. Like, we know when Messiah come, woman. You know who you're talking to. Let, let me tell you, let me tell you a story. First of all, let, give me the drink. <laughs> then he walks through it and you realize, and then he comes and say, woman, you don't even know what you worship. You all don't know. Do you understand that some people would think that was nice? That was not nice. Can you imagine somebody coming here and tell us, you don't know what you're worshiping? So you don't know what you worship. None of you all up here. It's a woman, the time is coming and now is when you won't worship in this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Because I'm going because he's going to take it higher. Because God is spirit. You'll worship him in spirit and truth. Did you have any other comments, Gary, except that I wasn't talking loudly enough? Well, I appreciate everybody joining us in today, joining with us today, as I'm about to close out the discussion. Because sometimes when I get ready to close out discussion, then what will happen is somebody will say something. So I'm giving them like that last warning. May Yahweh the Most High God bless us and keep us, make his glorious face to shine upon us and be gracious to us and give us his peace. Better yet, give us his shalom which even goes higher than what we think peace is. Amen, amen, and even so, amen.